Good morning and welcome to Morning Worship for January 10th. As you know, our buildings are closed at the moment as we felt that was the safest thing to do in light of these increased infection rates and the pressure on our health service. We intend to review this at the end of January, but I do feel that this is probably longer term than that. We'll just have to watch and see what the government says, what the state of play is in terms of the general public health. But for the time being, we're online again, and we will continue to review that to make sure that at some point we can return to our churches as soon as we can. It's very easy at times like this, particularly when you feel like this virus is never going to go away, it's never going to become less deadly, that um, we're never going to see our freedoms again. It's very easy to lose hope. But God's people have been living through hopelessness for thousands of years. And we turn to him. Our confidence is in God. We know that things don't get sorted immediately. We know that there are times when we have to live through times of trouble, times of strife. And I think the strongest question, biggest question for Christians at this time is not why is this happening to us, but rather what are we going to do during this? What will we do for our neighbor? How will we sustain our hope amongst each other? And how will we maintain our faith and hope individually? And that's why it's important we meet in whatever possible way we can and the safest ways that we can, is so that we can support one another and we together can go to that place that gives us hope and sustains us. And in scripture, that's always a place of worship, a place of seeking the presence of God and the presence of one another. So with that intention on our hearts, let's pray. This is the message we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Christ is our peace who has made us one. He has broken down the barriers which divided us. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope to which we were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. People of God, return. You are called to be God's own. From the mountains announce the good news. God comes in justice and peace to all who follow his ways. You are God's children. Lord, make us one in the peace of Christ, today and forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God shall make my darkness to be bright. The light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Ascribe to the Lord, you powers of heaven. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the honour due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is mighty in operation. The voice of the Lord is a glorious voice. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flash of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forests bare. In his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the water flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. We're looking at the baptism of Jesus today, a, a revelation of who he is, but also an invitation to us to identify ourselves with him. We're going to renew our baptism vows today, which is why I've asked you to bring a candle with you this morning. Um, we're going to light those candles after we do this, this next little bit. But we're going to renew our vows 
We're going to re-own our baptism, the things that were said if we were infants when we were baptized, things that were said on our behalf in hope, or maybe things that we said ourselves because we were baptized as an adult. But whatever it is or however we feel, it's a chance to say those words, to own them. And then like we do at the end of the baptism service in church, we give the family a candle. And I always talk about that light being a light that's passed on from Christian to Christian to Christian. And that is we have this new child there who we all hope will grow up in this faith. We pass on that light of hope to them as well. So I've got a little bit of a candle thing on here uh, after we say the vows. But if you brought a candle as well, that would be fantastic if you light that. Just as a reminder to you that you live in the light of Christ and the promise of that light. So let's enter into these vows together and let's share that light of Christ together. In baptism, God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? I reject them. Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? I renounce them. Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? I repent of them. Do you turn to Christ as Savior? I turn to Christ. Do you submit to Christ as Lord? I submit to Christ. Do you come to Christ the way, the truth, and the life? I come to Christ.
John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. That John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son and Beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. This morning we've had readings about Jesus' baptism. And one of the first questions we really have to have, which we share with John the Baptist and other gospel accounts, is why? Why is he doing this? Baptism isn't something that Jesus needs to do, is it? Our understanding of baptism as people of faith is that it is either, if you're an infant, an expression of the aspiration that you will become part of the family of God by your own willingness. That's why we have confirmation where you can declare your ownership of your baptism vows. In other traditions, they don't baptize infants. They only baptize adults who say, I'm a Christian and I want to declare my Christian faith to, um, to the world. But under either measure, Jesus doesn't need to do either one of those. He doesn't have to stand up and say, I've been redeemed, I've converted, I'm accepting Jesus into my heart, this is who I'm going to be. And at the same time, it's not an aspiration either. He's not being baptized as a, we hope you'll grow up into somebody who will follow Christ. And yet when people, when John the Baptist says, no, you shouldn't be doing, you should be baptizing me, which is another gospel account, Jesus says, no, it's right for us to be doing this. It's right for me to be here being baptized. In the Gospel of Mark, we have a very shortened account, which is true of just about everything Mark does. Mark always seems to be in a hurry to get to the next place. So we have Jesus turning up to the place where John the baptizer is baptizing people and telling them, leave your sins behind in the river, come out and face towards the kingdom of God because it's here. And the one who's initiating that kingdom and driving that kingdom forward you want to know him. You don't want to be in opposition to him. And people are responding and they're confessing their sins and asking for forgiveness. They're, they're repenting. They're turning around and walking in the new way into the light rather than away from it. So what's Jesus doing as part of this? What's this scene telling us? I think there's three things that we could reflect fruitfully on as we look at this scene. The first one is that no matter what tradition you're in, baptism is a rite of inclusion. In the Anglican Church, we baptize loads of infants. We're including them into the family of God with a hope that they will take their place as a knowing adult who will speak those words for themselves. We're supporting a family who we hope are saying we want our child to be a member of the family of God and to know God deeply through Jesus Christ. I often say to families who I meet um, in baptism preparation is that what all these words of promise are really saying is that to the best of your ability, you're going to point your child towards the life of God and the light of God. And for that to be the path that you all journey in uh, together. Whether they do that or not really isn't the big issue. It's the, this is what you're doing. This is what these promises are about. It's an aspirational thing at that point. They're promising to have a go at adopting the life of Christ as their life. If you've grown up in other traditions, particularly like the Baptist church, you have what's called believer's baptism, that you reach a certain age and you may want to say, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I've repented of my sins and this is the new way I'm going. Looks a lot like John the baptizer's baptism, I guess. And you use your public proclamation of your faith. Again, it's aspirational. It's partly saying, this is what I'm going to put the rest of my life doing. But it's also an inclusion. I am part of all of you now. All of you believers who are here witnessing it, I'm one of you. 
So baptism is ultimately a sign and a seal of who you belong to or who you desire to belong to. And I think for Jesus, that's a really, really accurate thing. Look, everyone, this is who I belong to. This is the way that my life is pointing. It doesn't matter whether he is actually the one who makes it possible. Isn't it great for all those people to see, to see him and to say, he's one of us. He is going in that direction too. He is drawing closer to God the Father. I always find that really quite heartening that Jesus doesn't leave us behind and wait somewhere far away and say, once you get here, things will be okay. And I think that's my second point. He didn't need any cleaning off. He didn't need any washing away of his sins. Instead, as I just said before, he's pointed in the right direction and calling others to follow him in that direction. That you're one of, I'm one of you, so let's go. A very pointed thing about Jesus is you will always find him more likely in the presence of who we would call sinners and people who are in the wrong than in the people who have arrived, the kind of people who are in the VIP arrival lounge. He's always at the departure lounge. And I think that's really, really important for us to focus on. This baptism is good, so I'll, I'll undertake it. And that's a really, really powerful thing. What better place to be than in the presence of Christ? And Christ who's not judging me as I come out of the water, but instead calls me brother, calls me friend, calls me sister, says you are part of my family. You're part of my, my, my gang, my crew, my whatever, my tribe. So let's go together into that great future that God is preparing for us in his kingdom. Let's learn that hard life of the kingdom Let's learn how to be different people and to live by different values, different rules, and different ways of behavior. Not because we're being good and earning our way, but because we're truly transformed people. We're people who are good for the world, who are good for the kingdom. People who are living the way they were created to be. The third thing that I wanted to say, really, is that we get this fantastic picture of this moment of inclusion, this snapshot of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All of them are there to say, this is good. This is my beloved Son. This is the one you should listen to. This is the one on whom my kingdom is based, the one who will make my kingdom possible through his life and his death and his resurrection. That's a really powerful moment. It would be fantastic to be there to see that, but we have to get it secondhand. But here is the one. Jesus calls us to a life that he enters into himself. And that's something that we shouldn't underestimate. We find Jesus in the midst of people who need him most, people who are looking for repentance, people who are looking for a new way and don't quite know how to find it. They come out to see John the Baptist because they think maybe this is the way to do it, and they find Jesus there. Through this baptism and my repenting of my sins, I now see the one who makes all of that possible, but also is the answer to the what next. Follow me and I'll show you what's next because I know where I'm going and I know what I'm doing. And this finished point where all of heaven says, he's the one, follow him and you will find this kingdom and you'll find your place in this kingdom and you will find life. So it's worth reflecting on our baptism vows and the commission that we're given as Christian people. I'm a minister, but I'm a minister in a role, in an office, but we're all ministers commissioned by our baptism vows that call us to be people who are radically transforming the world through love and through peace and through justice and through transmitting to others some knowledge of who God is and the greatness and goodness of, of him. So spend some time today thinking about what it means to be a baptized person. Go back and look at those vows that, um, that you, you um, have made today and see what difference it might make in your life every day if you begin to take those words seriously as your kind of mantra or motto as you go into the world. So be blessed today and remember that you're blessed 
and that you have a whole family around you who want to see you thrive and to see you grow into the likeness of Christ. Amen. We're going to offer some of our prayers to God together. There are some set prayers here which um, I've been using over the last couple of weeks and I think they work really well in terms of helping us to speak out to God in the situation that we're in and the season that we're in as well. A season of revelation, a season of epiphany where we see God at work in a radical, um, awesome way. Also, there will be space for you to just reflect quietly, no music, no, no other distractions on the intercessions that you have in your heart, the, the things that you have brought into this place from the world that you live in. So let's turn our hearts and thoughts to prayer. We pray for the coming of God's kingdom. You sent your son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your Spirit, rouse us to work in his name. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. Father, use us as weak as we are to bring in your kingdom of mercy, justice, love and peace. Empower us by your spirit and unite us in your son, that all our joy and delight may be to serve you now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God, and makes Christ known in the world? 
we believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. As our prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise, now and forever. Amen. Again, thank you for joining with me this morning or whenever you're going to be watching this. Do be safe and careful and sensible during this time. If you are struggling with anything, please reach out to those you know who care for you and can offer you help. But don't suffer in any way by yourself or assume that nobody cares about what's happening. These are trying, difficult, frustrating times. I know that we're weary of this and we just want it to go away. But let's remain with this blessing on our hearts and this sustaining presence of God with us that we might use this time well. Use this time well to care for each other, to care for ourselves and to learn to live in hope. So blessings to you and I hope that your week is, is fantastic and that you're able to do the things that you want to be able to do within the limitations that our lives are under at the moment. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye.